Hi guys, we are back. So this is the last portion, last but not least. So this is about the continuous about this uh, motor cortical integration. So earlier we talked about, let me, let me share the screen. Oh, let me, let me, uh, did I record? Man, it was like, yes, it's recording, good. So, so, so this actually is my second recording. If you, if you, if some of you guys probably know, I upload the one, but I did not do screen sharing. Man, it's all right. I can do it. I can do this one. Share. Here we go. All right. So this is the portion that um the part of the uh, brain cortical integration. And uh, here we are going look into in looking looking into several spe specialized area for for the motor control. So that include the area identified right here, the hand skills, head rotation, uh, controllator eye movements, and uh, word formation. This is also called the broadcast area. So this is in the frontal lobe. So you you should have that kind of that concept that the frontal portion is for motor, the periato is for sensory. So these are all for motor, but you should know that a lot of these need to take information from the periato. Um, so that's all, that's why we also mentioned some specialized area. They, although they are not motor, but they provide important information for the motor control in the frontal. For example, uh, this one choice of words. So this region is called the Berninke. We later will talk about that. What's that to do with the motor? So you need to know that this is a region in the for the auditory cortex, the primary auditory cortex. And this region is the association, associated area for the auditory cortex. So this is about listening. And this region is specialized for understanding the words. And this is further specialized, not just hearing, but also reading. When you read the words, you basically form the language from that auditory and process those in this area. So that's right. And, and that is important for forming a speech. So when you speak, you basically have to uh, work with these two area in order to get the words in your brain and uh, talk it out. And, uh, and that is, this is the motor region and this is the auditory area. We also have this region. This is very occipital. This is the V1, right? The stride cortex that we talk about. And, uh, and, uh, and so this is I about vision. And why is that to do with the motor? One, Earlier we talked about the vision, we talked about the uh, eye movement reflexes. There are so many circuits in the brain to process the eye movement. Eye is one of region um, very important to human being and also very complicated. So we talked about several eye movement control and a lot of those control actually is control here. In fact, that here um, is a region um, and, uh, um, and uh, 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 the more, the more we learn, this is, this is a, a picture coming from the uh, uh, guide and hall, uh, the textbook that we use for uh, school medicine students. But this is very, very um, like a simplified way to present this in the, for the, eye movement, we, we have the region called the frontal eye field. That's more like a, uh, 
a specific term for the eye movement in the frontal area. We have that uh, frontal eye field and that that need to tax. So a lot of that eye movement is to, to conduct a gaze, right? Conduct a saccade, conduct the smooth uh, pursue movement. And all, a lot of this is related to the vision. So you need to have that visual information in order to provide the target, the, 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 the fixing point that you are going to, to, to gaze on. And that information would then send to the frontal, provide this region to co co uh, cooperate different portion in our nervous system in order to control the muscle. We have the lateral rectus, medial rectus, and to control the saccade of the eye movement as well as to fixing our vision in a specific target. So that's that. All right, so we will look into each one of these and then, um, and then let's start by looking into the very first one. So these, you know, how do we know this? Uh, in the very beginning, we 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 uh, we try to understand the brain. So the way we do it, people do it, is that they will use electrode and to stimulate different cortical region. And by stimulating those, then uh, to see what kind of motion is affected, movement is affected, and the data. Um, and, uh, and a lot of time we also can learn this from a lesion. If there's any lesion there, then we can observe the patients and to see what kind of motion deficit uh, is, is, is produced from the patient. And then we know that, that then we know that what the, the, the major function of that area. Later, we have new technology, right? In the old time, we use electrophysiology to detect those now we have newer technology. Uh, we could do something non-invasive. Um, for example, a lot of new data coming from the MRI, the functional MRI. And, uh, and so we, we get to, by doing so, we get to get more and more evidence and get more and more understanding about how these circuits communicate with each other, yeah. So that's that. All right, so let's start by talking about the very first one, the broadcast area. Broadcast area is probably the most, uh, the, the, the most studied, uh, the, 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 the best accepted area. A lot of this area is kind of evolved that um, in this figure, this one talk about this area, but, but later we, we have more specific region for specific function. And so, but this broad area is very well understand and very well um, accepted area. All right, so this is the, uh, the, the region conduct the speech. So this is the motor region. So Broca is the motor speech area. This area control our motor and to conduct very fluent speech. Um, speech is quite important, um, especially for human being. Um, be able to speech, having this kind of circuit to control our muscle to speak and all have this all anatomy there to be able to speech is very important for human and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, set us aside from other animals. Of course, humans are, have larger brain, you know, is smarter than the other animal. And that is, it's very good advantage for a human. But be able to speak, let us be able to communicate. So we are not just having a single person's wisdom. We can communicate. So we can form a wisdom from a community. So that's more than just one smart person, but a collective knowledge. And these people can do different tasks so we can complete a bigger project. And the speech play a very important role to that. So we can 
describe an idea, we can share the idea. And that's all because of the speech. And of course, after that, we can summarize all this knowledge and uh, present it, write a book. So we can be able to transduce the knowledge from one generation to the next generation. So the knowledge can be built, can be collectively grouped together and, uh, and, uh, and not just one person, not just one community, not just one generation, but generation after generation. That, that's, that, that let us be able to very quickly uh, transform from say prehistorical time to very quickly move on to like common like 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 current modern society. So that that that's that's a part of speech, and that is very well controlled, heavily really controlled by this region, broadcast area. If, if this region is affected, then the person will have difficulty to speak and it will be stuttering and it's called aphasia. Aphasia have two types. One is the broadcast aphasia. The other one is the Verninki. We will talk about that. So these two regions basically work together. One is the motor speech. The other one is the auditory area for speech. So the Verninki area, this is the region that we, we talk about. This is about the um, association region for the auditory cortex. And, uh, and uh, this is called the Verninki's area. This area is about understanding. So uh, when we hear, we hear sound, but when we hear speech, we need to identify the words and we need to know that where it stop where it continue and then we need to process those words to become a meaningful words so that is the function of this burning keys area and this work with Braga and to allow us to be able to very fluently listen communicate and talk using words, so that's that. This region also take information from the visual because um, when we read words, we basically pronounce it in our brain in this region and to understand those words. Of course, we can also take it from the primary somatic sensory so we can have the, the words by using touch right so for the people who is blind they can they can they can touch the i don't know how to call it but you can touch and feel the taxes and to understand the meaning of it so that's that's this region the verninkis area to to process the words so that's that and then so it did to uh uh, two type of the if 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 any of this re region is 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 injured, then the person will have difficulty to produce speech, and that's called the aphasia. So we can have the motor deficit leading to the Verninki aphasia, or the sorry the motor as deficit to leading to the Braga aphasia, or is the auditory uh, deficit leading to the Berninki uh, aphasia. So that's that. All right. And, uh, and uh, just uh, give you a broader view, like kind of review and uh, refresh what we have learned before and apply this into this Brahmins area. So I assume you know this Brahmins area in your anatomy lesson lectures, right? So in the brain is, uh, uh, there are several, uh, there are uh, regions that we, 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 we label them with the number, this is called the uh, Brahman's number, Brahman's area. And here it shows some selective region. And, uh, and uh, a lot of this, we, before you probably know the anatomy, and then now you should have a feeling about it. You should know the, 
function of them and also know their clinical relevance and how do they affect your life. So for example, uh, uh, in the beginning, it, uh, sorry, from, uh, we can start from here. Uh, we can start from here. This region we just talked about, the Berninkis. This is the auditory association cortex. This is very near the primary auditory cortex. It's a relatively a small area, but we do have a lot of like association region to allow us to understand when you hear something, right? And uh, when you hear the speech, when you hear the words, these are the region process those information. And then we also talk about the uh, the uh, the visual cortex that we 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 learned in the, uh, last week, and this is primary, and this is the visual association cortex. We also call it extra stride cortex. And uh, from there, we can uh, be able to uh, recognize object. And uh, when we recognize object, when we recognize words, we will trans. We will send that information to here uh, to process those words. And then we will also have the uh, sensory area, somatic sensory area, the primary somatic sensory cortex. And then we also then this this lecture it's about the motor. This is the primary motor is in area four and the premotor area six and uh, six uh, down here. And also uh, supplementary motor area in more like uh, longitudinal feature area. And then we also have this region. This is a region that does control our eye movement. Eye movement has several type. The major one, not, not exactly a lot, a lot. A lot uh, basically there are maybe two, three types. One is the a smooth pursuing eye movement. So you can you can follow something that you see and continuing. So you need to kind of predict its next step. And your eye basically can real time following it, which is if you do, if you try to make a, the robot to do it, you will find that's very difficult. How can you tell the robot that the thing is moving like randomly, but your robots can can fix the can gaze on it and continuing uh, seeing it. Right, right. So, 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 but we can do it. So we kind of have the ability to predict its next step, but and then we can fix our eye on that. Then that is because we communicate with the visual cortex. So that is the one of the eye movement. Another movement is the saccade, right? If you go to the eye doctor, that uh, they probably will conduct a, a type of exam that they will put two flashlight, left and right, and uh, they will ask you to see the red light, left light, red, right light, left light. And you need to move your eyeball like very quickly, right? very quickly to see one and the other. That's the gates. Gates can be controlled. The gates, the, the, the center portion is here, the frontal eye, but the, to control this muscle, it could involve several neurons. We talk about there are six muscles to control the eyeball. And the part of this is in the pontine. Part of this is in the frontal and also you need to um, uh, you need to control that so 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 that is the saccade right yeah and also that later we will talk about the frontal portion is also very important to control uh, uh, the the saccade saccade can be visually stimulated so that is you need to see it so you need to communicate with this visual area and that provide the eye fixation information to the, this is the, re, the region that we talk about that 
the frontal eye field. It basically, this is more like professional way to like uh, a common, if you look, look into the literature, this is the word you should search for, frontal eye field. Um, people don't usually call it like controlator eye movement. Yeah, so that's, so that's that region. And then we have the frontal cortex. Frontal, prefrontal is the one that to about the decision making. So this eye is in the motion and also in the border of this prefrontal. So a lot of these can be controlled by your by your by your intention. So that's that. So let's look into this one. Eye field, eye field, frontal eye field. The reason we call it the frontal eye field is because here we it's a periato eye field. So that is the two different. Uh, the, this one is about to control the eye. And uh, a lot of our eye movement here, we also have eye movement as well as the head movement, right? The head rotation. This one here, head rotation, eye movement. So that these two are very uh, close, close related to each other because when we when we conduct the uh, gates, uh, saccade, and uh, a lot of time this saccade can be a visual driven, um, and uh, not just that, uh, we can also have non visual driven saccade. So for the non-visual driven circadians, for example, the auditory, when you hear something, you will look into it. And when you look into it, not just moving eye, but you also moving head. You but your your focus, your your what your the entire circuit is trying to move your visual field to something that you are interested. And we some although that is a voluntary movement, right? But this is driven by an auditory. And this become a type of like reflexes. You hear something, you respond to it and you watch it. So that is, it could be the visual when you see uh, see something happening, you probably will keep watching it, right? It, this, this, that's why that's, the, I will move into this side. That's why that uh, driving with using cell phone is not good because you will do it even though, even though that this is the, Every muscle is skeletal muscle, so that movement is a voluntary movement. But, but, but you basically do it as a reflexes. When you hear, you watch it. When you see something, you watch it. And uh, uh, a lot of time with that, when we drive, we 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 watch some like if there is a say a car accident in the side, you probably will watch it. Like if you drive through, the, there is wildfire down there. You will probably keep watching it, right? So, so we our visual can be affected, our circuit, our eye fixation, can be affected by the visual stimulus, by auditory stimulus. Can, it can be also be driven by non-visual, non-auditory, right? Something not presented. So for example, you go to went to you go you went to you go to a room, and uh, you 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 got dropped by a water, and uh, and you watch it. Right, and you could do it several times, or you see a spot there, and the next time you do, you you walk there, you will you will you will watch because that's a, that's a memory, and and you will you will just watch it, right, and uh, and uh, and uh, and so so a lot of that is driven by sensory. However, this frontal region also conduct an important uh, movement because of that is very closely related to the prefrontal a decision making. So this region is particularly important for a voluntary. That means that it's also called anti-saccade movement. That is a saccade, but you know you should watch while you are driving, you should you know you should not pay attention on your cell phone. You should watch the road. That's an anti-saccade. And uh, so um, so so that is the importance about this this area. So eye fixation versus voluntary eye movement. Eye fixation can be driven by sensory, by memory, but we can voluntarily using our 
decision making circuits to decide not to be controlled by that. So the eye tend to look, tend to look involuntarily on specific objects. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is the uh, signal from the occipital visual system. All right, something that stimulates your visual and you will try, you, you, you are interested, you want to see what's going on. So you look at that, not just your eye, but your head, right? So the eye head movement basically are very closely related. And then, um, and the, but this region provide this pre-motor uh, in the border of the prefrontal is important to conduct a decision. You decide not to follow that eye fixation. Yeah, so that's 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 that. And also the hair rotation area. So this one is is trying. It's basically working with the eye movement, and uh, to to conduct the uh, smooth object. Uh, smooth pursuing eye movement and also uh, to, to, to conduct the uh, eye fixation. So I, I use this uh, picture as example. Probably everyone, if you don't have the case, you, you still know that the cats like to follow uh, the, 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 what's that? Laser, laser, laser point, right? Laser pointer, right? Yeah, so you put it there and the cats will We'll, we'll try to do that. And uh, so it's not just the eye, but also the head, right? So that, that these two work together to, uh, to, to fix our visual field in the object that we are interested. We also have this region called the hand skills. And this is the uh, designated specialized area for our fine hands movement. Um, and also, also, so that, that's that. These are the uh, specialized area for the motor control. And, uh, and, uh, and all right, so that's that. And then what we, what we want to know next is the cortical layer. So it's, it's just like the, in the, in the sensory, uh, cortex, we have six layer in the cortex. In the sensory, uh, we talk about these primary somatic sensory. We also talk about the visual sensory cortex. In the sensory, the input signal, so there are six layer, six layer. The input signal is in the fourth layer. As for the motor, now the input signal will be a lot, but the output signal will be on at in the fifth layer. Uh, fifth layer. All right. So they, 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 they will be they will receive all this information and will conduct one command, collect all this input and produce one output. That output is from the fifth layer. There is a special type of the neuron to this is top of the this type of the uh the uh, upper motor neuron to conduct that kind of output signal this neuron is called the pyramidal cell and that's why we call the cortical spinal tract we can also call it as the uh, uh, pyramidal tract so that's the this is the pyramidal cells. And uh, so that is the cell. So this is uh, a, a good, good region to have the quiz question, right? The which layer is the output signal from the motor cortex? And which cells provide that output axon? The layer is the fifth layer, the cell is the pyramidal cells. And so that's the cortex output we already know cells that and uh, and what the information the cortex receive what's the information that motor cortex 
motor cortex is the integrate integration integrating center. So they basically receive uh, information from a lot of area, right? And uh, um, all these other region, when they send signal into the cortex, they go through the thalamus. So it is from the thalamus. But thalamus is just a hub. And so you should know that this basically collect all the information from the cerebellum, from the uh, brainstem, from the uh, body, right? Several sensory region. In the cortex though, it will also communicate with each other. So you can see that this is center, in the center, like headquarter. In the headquarter, there are different department, right? So that different department will communicate very freely very uh, commonly among them, but to communicate with outside, they will go through this thermos. Thermos will collect all the information and then send to the headquarter and then headquarter. So this portion is the headquarter, like other cortical region that is different department in the headquarter from the opposite, side so we, we have the left and right hemisphere center is the corpus callosum the white matter to communicate be, between two and so one region to control the the movement will need to get the information from the other side so that's that oh so this is corpus callosum this is white matter this is more like anatomy but I, I assume you should you should know this already right you should know the different like white matter and this is a big one. So, all right, so that's that. The input signal basically is the headquarter talk to each other while they take signal from the basal ganglia top. As for the output, the output, so this is efferent, the output. Output signal could include several. One is the cortical spinal tracts that we talk about that can directly act on the lower motor neuron. It will also send signal into the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia. Send signal to the basal ganglia, right? Because, because this is the one that we talked earlier. Uh, the cerebral cortex, when they when they have need any information, they will they will channel through the basal ganglia, then send back to the cortex. So, so that when they send signal to the basal ganglia, it's a you know premature thought, and the basal ganglia will channel it to tell the brain to do it or not. So that's the part of the output. Then it was also sent signal to the red nuclei. So this one is related to the rubral spinal tract, right? And uh, also send signal into the, so this one is um, to kind of provide a supplementary circuit for any fine movement. Cortical spinal tracts conduct the fine movement. Rubral spinal tracts kind of parallel with cortical spinal tracts. These two are two of these four supraspinal tracts that we talked earlier. It will also send you know, into the reticular formation, vestibular nuclei. So this one is one that while we are doing any movement, we will also control its muscle tone and also maintain body balance. It will also send signal into the cerebellum. And when they send, send signal to the cerebellum, they need to pass through the pound time. So that's that. All right, so that ends, that, that's about, that's probably ends it. And then here is kind of give you a, not, a, an overview again about this motor control system. So we, 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 we now should have the sense that um, motor and the sensory are quite different in a way that sensory in a way it kind of work along, like work 
by itself, you can talk about the visual and you don't really need to talk about anything else. You can talk about the somatic sensory and you don't need, really need to talk about anything else. We can choose to talk one and the other. We didn't talk about the auditory. We didn't need to talk about the olfactory. Those are also sensory, right? But we, we, can, we can complete that visual pathway without mention about other sensory. We can talk about the somatic sensory pathway, DCML, ALS, but we don't need to mention about the others. However, motor is very different. You will not be able to talk about one region without talking about the other. When we talk about the lower motor, we will have to talk about the supraspinal tracts. When we talk about the brainstem, we have to talk about the cerebellum. When we talk about the cerebellum, we will talk about the brainstem. So these are very important related and these are also related by the cortex. When we talk about the cortex, we have to talk about these circuits and that involve the basal ganglia. So everything is integrated together. That's the, the, the beauty of the motor system. It's, it's not just one do thing its own. It's a collective effort to conduct a smooth movement. All right, so this one, so basically we have finished all these different components in the motor system, in the motor circuits. It includes the lower motor region in the spinal cord, the brainstem. Here in the brainstem, we have um, three different supraspinal tracts. We have the vestibular spinal tract, reticular formation, reticular spinal tract. And we also have a red nuclei. Red, red nuclei is a little bit in the midbrain, uh, rubro spinal tracts. Then we also have the cerebellum. So you should know that what's the function of, what's the major function of the rub vestibular vest and uh, reticular and uh, rubro spinal tracts. We also have this portion mentioned about the cerebellum. When we talk about the cerebellum, you should know that there are three division. And uh, the major function of the cerebellum is to, uh, to um, control the body balance. It takes the information from the vestibular sensory organ as well as the vestibular nuclei. It sends out a signal to the vestibular to the radicular and the uh, rubro, it will also send out signal to the cortex. And uh, this region collect all the information about vestibular as well as the information from the uh, proprioception and also information from the cortex to conduct the, to allow this movement, while allow this movement to be performed while consider the body balance, the muscle tone, the gravity. So that's a function of the cerebellum. We also then talk about the basal ganglia. What's the major function of the basal ganglia? Choice, right? The action choice. So this is important to conduct the routine behavior. And so we don't need to, we have this one dominate our routine behavior. So our brain can focus on something that's interesting, that's more, that's, that's more creative. We don't need to, but a lot of time we just follow in that routine, right? You, we have that every day, like day and day and day, we do the same thing over and over again, because we don't think, we're just following it. You go to the next stop, text and uh, you turn on the computer and uh, you watch video or something just day and day and day, right? And this is also very much, we, 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 we can be a master of it. That's why, that's why in, the, in, the, in the very beginning of this lecture, it's not, it's, it's, it's feel like far away, but it's not that far away, right? It's, it's about eight weeks ago, right? In the very beginning of the, the lecture, I I I I I, um, I said this uh, in the very beginning that I would like to 
create a pattern of this lecture. We have two lecture per week. By the end of the week, we have an exam. So we practice it. We practice it. Why do we want to build a pattern? If we have the pattern, we will do it without making a lot of effort. And that will make the study very easy, very smooth. That basically take the advantage of the basal ganglia. We can do that. If you build a good habit, build a good pattern of the routine behavior, you, in the beginning, it takes some effort, but if you do it two, three times, you will be, it will be automatic. And, if, and since this is a good thing to do, we build a pattern. We don't need to reinvent in the wheel, right? We, we can build a pattern and, the, and the, that help us to study. We can let the basal ganglia to control our routine while we can use our brain to study this new knowledge, to think about this new knowledge and to think about the, how would you use this learned mechanism to improve your own life and also to help your patients. So that's the basal ganglia. Then we talk about the motor cortex. The motor cortex is the, the toughest portion of the motor control. This conduct the information, conduct the, the way that the motor cortex conduct its function is to basically just hit the button, right? And then when you hit the button, it will trigger the circuits store in different region and uh, we will perform it. A lot of time, this performance may not be perfect in the beginning, but we can practice, we can improve it. Once it's improved, it's cir the circuit is stored. What brain will do is just hit the button and then we do it. So that's that. So that's just, uh, I will use this, uh, the following, uh, maybe seven, nine slices to, uh, seven, eight slices to, uh, kind of give you an overview of what we have learned about this motor system. So in the lower motion, lower motor area, we learned about this lower motor area in the spinal cord. And this motor is about motor control. So this is about the skeletal muscle. We learned that there are two types of muscle, intrafusal and the extrafusal. Extrafusal is controlled by the alpha motor neuron. Intrafusal is controlled by the gamma motor neuron. So, and, uh, and, uh, and here we also have two type of the uh, uh, somatic, sorry, two type of the muscle spindle, the primary ending and the secondary ending. So we learned about this. So this is the direct control of the muscle. If we look into, into the detail about this one, we will learn about, we will, it will lead to about this acetylcholine, how does acetylcholine release, recycled, how do they control the muscle, how does muscle contract. We all learn this, so you are perfect. You are the professional on this already, okay? Now, in the entire circuit, this one plays an important role in, in the direct control of the muscle. This one also, in the, in the, this is in the muscle, in the spinal cord, in the spinal cord. This one is also conduct a lot about these reflexes. We already talked about one reflex, which is the, which is the stretch reflex. However, there are many. We all, I also mentioned about the local motion circuits, which is also stored in the spinal cord. And, uh, and that's why that's, uh, you, when you walk, you don't really need to think. Uh, I used to, uh, my kids used to ask me a question that if you, if you, if you cut the chicken's head, would chicken still wrong? Well, chicken will not be balanced, but they still wrong, okay? Because the running, swimming, walking is controlled by the local motion. It's not by the brain, but it's circuits in the spinal cord. And, uh, and uh, what brain do is to, trigger it. So that program is already programmed in your lower motion area. Program trigger it and you conduct it. You just need to get triggered. 
So that's the spinal cord. They store a lot of circuits to, and that circuit basically builds up during a uh, very essential period of time in the, uh, the development. And, uh, and uh, you probably would know that different people may have different style or different posture, different uh, way to walk. And why is that? How do we work differently, even though that is circuit? Because that during the development, you learn it from your parents. You learn it comes could be the genetic control, but diff people different work live differently. Uh, you probably know that. You probably very know that when you hear someone walk by, you can kind of listen to it and then know that who is coming. That shoes could be the issue, right? And but if you look in the profile, you know that who is walking. So that is built because that uh, we learned this this circuit is can be modified, and uh, it's dynamic. It's controlled by supraspinal tracts, and uh, and uh, um, and that can be modified and learned throughout our development. Then we talk about these two area in the brain stem. This is very important in maintaining body balance because don't forget we are living on the earth and there is gravity. So we need to have the muscle tone to, to keep us in the, in the right position and, uh, and also be able to freely move our body to conduct the movement that we want. So that is controlled by vestibular and the reticular formation in the brainstem. We also talk about the cerebellum. This cerebellum area has three divisions. Uh, we have the vestibular cerebellum. Vestibular meaning that it's about vestibular, vestibular apparatus. This is about the body balance. And the uh, spinal cerebellum, this send out signal into the red nuclei. And this, this is the region that uh, will have the information from the spinal, meaning that it's the somatic sensory area region, the receptor. Uh, the major one is the proprioception. So the spinal will send the proprioception and, uh, and, uh, and so this region will be able to collect the information from the proprioception and also from the cortex. So they can compare to see uh, the person want to perform a movement. And uh, during this, using this body balance information and uh, to see if that movement meets the, the needs, meets the plan. And if they do, then it's, it's good. If it's not, then they can correct. So this is more like a, skill the movement, but you need to adjust the good timing to amplitude. You need to adjust the good timing and the good amplitude in order to complete this movement. While in a, in a, in a, in a, while maintain the body balance, right? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that, that's why I, 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 I really, enjoy watching the basketball the NBA. I don't I don't really watch it recently like this past couple of years but I used to I just don't have time right? at this time I have um, too much of this work and also um, and uh, yeah but but I used to like to watch it a lot and, uh, and uh, because when you watch the basketball you 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 feel the beauty of these the the, the power of this cerebellum you see the people trying to keep body balance, try to keep body balance while they jump in the air and, uh, and, and also making the shoots, right? And that, I bet that this is not their first time doing it in their life. This take practice. And that practice is improved by this spinal cerebellum. And also this is the cerebral cerebellum. This cerebral cerebral is to communicate with the cerebral cortex. So that is, again, I can use the basketball as an example that you, you move your ball and are trying to pass through people's, right? Human beings, 
and then then you move the that and the, and you 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 everything is very dynamic and so your brain need to be able to consider your cerebral need to consider the body balance your skill your you move your ball is that is part of the training and then you need to be able to respond to this very dynamic environment in the, the game and that is the cerebral 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 that your cortical need to decide what to do the next is a split second thing you need to do that you need to be able to quickly control your muscle program in advance okay so you have that plan to control your muscle required for a rapid smooth rapid and smooth progression of the of changing directions so that that's that's this so very beautifully presented in the the game in the in the uh, basic sport so that's this cyber and so that and then we have the uh yeah so that's that and uh and uh so when we having this information in mind having all these circuits in mind we know that there are different level of the movement control say say this one gates and the posture walking right and uh, or standing this control basically controlled by this multiple level from very basic one very direct one to something in the middle and something in the top so for example that our gates is controlled by the local motion so it's a circuit in the spinal cord and that involves several reflex circuits as well as the local motion circuits but we also know that this is controlled by the brainstem so our brainstem will be able to control our muscle tone the pontine and the medicular red uh, rubro sorry pong time and the radicular sorry pong time at men, 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 and uh, medulla 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 medullary uh, radicular spinal tracts control the excitation and the uh, and the inhibition of the gamma motor neuron so that control the enhanced and the relax of the muscle tone and that is required when we do the walking and uh, and the vestibular is important while we walk we keep body balanced so that is the brainstem level and the top we have the cerebellum is also part of it because cerebellum can control can affect this vestibular system through the vestibular cerebellum so vestibular control the brainstem brainstem affects the spinal cord spinal cord have these circuits to conduct the movement so it's like layer after layer overall that's these all influence our gates and the posture so that's that so when you see a patient who may walk very differently you should consider this region and uh, people are all different in the way of their walking even in their standing but this are can be all like affected and can be can be can be very easily not easily but can be modulated here i i, sh I provide you a short video to tell you to this is about a movie about the uh, Amy Schumer's movie, and uh, and I used to play this video in the in my last lecture. Uh, you know, I, my kids has a school, right? In their last day in school, they will have movie time, so we will do the same thing here. We will have some movie time and uh, popcorn, maybe you know some snacks, so we can watch the mo this movie together. Uh, but since this is pandemic, you can prepare your own popcorn, right? Watching this movie. And uh, so this is about you will you will be appreciated. You will, I hope you you will appreciate that how 
the knowledge we learn here can be applied into this movie about how this different region, when you see the posture, the gates uh, performing differently, and how is that different brain region affects that movement. The next one is the, say, skilled movement, right? This skilled movement is one that in a dynamic environment, meaning that we need to keep body balance. We need to conduct this anti-gravity muscle. We need to maintain a certain but dynamic muscle tone. And while complete a skilled movement, it requires it require some training. So this is very important in this spinal cerebellum. And uh, here I also provide you a video, you can watch it. And uh, to kind of get understanding, what do I talk about uh, that skill, the movement trained by the spinal cerebellum. Also, in a way that walking is like a repeated movement, it's controlled by spinal cord, basal ganglia, spinal cerebellum, this skill of the movement is also when we learn it programmed, right? This is kind of like training a programming of a movement. Another level of this programmed training and become a routine behavior for this type of daily, walk, daily like behavior uh, basically are those involved in the sensory involved in the visual cue, a lot of the environment uh, cue, those are the uh, affected by the basal ganglia. So this routine behavior. Uh, this is powerful. This is very powerful that uh, people basically very easily to build a routine. So, uh, and also very difficult to break a routine. And, uh, and, uh, and you need to learn this and uh, be able to, if you, can, if you can be a master of it, you will, be, you will, you will, you will stand out. Um, this also kind of related to the self-discipline, right? You, you build that habit. In the beginning, you need to make effort. But once you build that habit, you will be programmed in the basal ganglia. And uh, here I also provide you this uh, video to show you the routine behavior. So this video is about factory worker, right? So they basically do the same thing. The difference between the routine behavior and the skilled movement uh, is that this skilled movement consider in the in the more like a, a to need to consider the body balance, the gravity controlled by, affected by the, controlled by this cerebellum. So they gather all the information about the vestibular signal, vestibule, and also uh, proprioception to maintain body balance while you complete a skilled movement. This routine is more like a visual cue or the sensory cue. And you do it, you don't really need to put a lot of effort in keeping body balance. This is more like wake up in the morning and uh, drinking a cup of coffee, get a shower, put the same dress on, walk out, left, right, left, left feet or right feet first. You know, that routine, if you do it, you go to the, 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 the classroom, if you go to the classroom, you sit the, on the same seat. The, vi the video I'm showing you is the factory manufacturer like worker and uh, so basically they will the first it's everything's new you need to have a training but you train it train a person in the way that you just follow this protocol it's all very a lot of it's all following basically following this principle the the visual cue so you you see the red lights you need to do this you see the projects coming in you fold it and the packet and move on you Fold it, pack it, and then move on. And uh, in the in the, the first time, it needs training, but it doesn't really require body balance. It just video cue, sensory cue, environmental cue, and you do it over and over again. It become a routine, and then you don't need to think. 
you will do it. So that's the routine behavior and that's the power of the basal ganglia. So I think that's it.